to say we need to see the piano. Right, right. <laughs> you look great. You look awesome. You are awesome. Priorities. Um, I've never used this app, so I hope it's gonna, I'm gonna manage to, to navigate through this. Um, I'm gonna be talking about The Healthy Pianist, and the subtitle of this one is Body Mapping. My disclaimer is that I'm not a medical professional. I do not provide medical advice. The information provided may be incomplete and or incorrect. It probably is. So the question is, why, why am I doing this presentation? Um, I actually did basically this presentation um, during our first Southern Utah Piano Pedagogy Conference a few years ago. So some of you were here. Um, it was really a great experience for me because I learned a lot about it and I started paying attention to what I'm doing, what my students are doing, and then over time, you know, I think I've become a better teacher, but you kind of forget about some of those things. This fall semester, I had a few students who are seniors uh, ask me if I have anything. One wanted to learn more about rotation and the other one about other sorts of uh, movements at the piano. And I was uh, remembering a book that I really liked in college, a book about piano technique by Seymour Fink. And he starts out the book by doing exercises away from the piano. And he has a different way of looking at the piano. So rather going from the bass to the treble, he sees it from the center out. And I started working on that with uh, some of my students and our um, chap uh, student, collegiate student chapter, Rhapsody in Red, presented on that um, at the UMTA State Conference. So I got kind of reinterested in it, and um, I thought I should know, you know, get back into that and, and learn more about it. And I'm good with uh, deadlines, so I thought if I sign up for the conference here, I'll have to do something. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> one thing about those presentations is that it's really hard to cut material. So last night I still had more than twice as many slides. Um, I cut it down. I think we'll be able to get through in about half an hour. Um, there's a lot, a lot about it. Something that I didn't do, uh, didn't include, is for example, hearing health. And also our student chapter presented on that a couple of UMTA state conferences ago. So there's aspects that I'm totally ignoring. There's aspects that I, I cut out. But this presentation is meant to provide food for thought. So if you're walking out of here and go like, hmm, does this really work like that? Then I think uh, I've achieved my goal. Um, first, a few numbers that I'm going to go over very briefly. Um, it's amazing how many musicians are actually suffering from pain, from playing-related pain. Um, and there are some studies. Here you can see a study about orchestra musicians. This is a study about college musicians. The numbers are really high. The number at the bottom, 6.1% have pain every time they play or sing. Those are undergraduate music majors at a um, Midwestern University, um, Columbia, Missouri, uh, to be precise. Uh, that's a high number. So if one out of 20 music majors are experiencing pain when they, every time they play or sing, that's uh, just a very high number. And that's not a music conservatory, you know, super high competition. Again, that's the University of Missouri in Columbia. Something else that I have found astounding, that's a new study I came across preparing for the presentation today. This is a study about a program in Germany called Jugend Musiziert, or Youth Making Music. Um, you basically start competing at a regional level, then at the state level, and then at the national level. It's not super high stakes, especially at the regional level. Um, it's very, very common. It's a great competition. Uh, there was a study um, done about that, and what is astounding is that in Germany, we have basically a multi-tiered high school system, and what they refer to here with the selected academic high school is basically those students who plan to go on to college. And then we also have specialized high school, for example, a high school for music specifically. And what is amazing is that one of the questions on the questionnaire was, I consider that pain associated with playing an instrument is normal. 
every parent in the normal, regular academic high school said, uh, nope. 25% uh, or 29% at the selective music high school said, yep, that's totally normal. And another 21% said, yeah, it's probably fine. So 50% of parents at a, a musical high school said, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to not feel great when, when you're playing. And of course, if parents feel that, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of competition. Um, you get the idea. Um, it's a full-on sport when you get tackled at the piano bench. I mean, it really is yeah. a lot it's of tough. <laughs> That's <laughs> high, school, high school for you. It, it is. Doesn't happen in middle school yet, but in high school. <laughs> Um, like I said, I'm going to leave out a lot of information, but um, what I ended up doing is kind of include a lot of information from this book by Thomas Mark, What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body. It's kind of a spin-off of What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. But he does a nice job uh, in explaining some of the things and just giving food for thought. Again, that's the topic today. He identifies four causes of injury. One of them is co-contraction. When one muscle contracts, the opposing muscle must release and lengthen to permit movement. If this does not happen, that is, if the opposing muscle remains tense, then both muscles are contracting simultaneously, which is called co-contraction. Um, I think that's just when we feel tense, it's probably co-contraction. It's like muscles are pulling in different directions. Then awkward positions, I think that is clear too. For example, if we play piano with a hand that looks like that, um, it's an awkward position or like that. Um, it's clear, probably not the best thing to do. There's also static muscular activity. If a muscle exerts force <coughs> without changing in length, the activity is called static. Static muscular activity is more stressful than dynamic activity. Dynamic activity permits circulation of the blood, whereas static activity inhibits blood circulation, causing the muscle to become fatigued and making it prone to injury. So if I you know, tighten up my upper arm and try to play like that, I can still move my fingers, but now I'm having static uh, muscular activity in my upper arm. And then excessive force is uh, something else that can cause injury and um, and what is interesting is that according to some studies, doubling the force multiplies stress on the tendons not by two, but by five. So if I hit the piano with twice as much force, um, it actually, the stress on the tendons is amplified by five. There are a few types of injuries that um, concern us pianists most often. Uh, one would be nerve entrapment. And this is from a book called Repetitive Strain Injury, a computer user's guide. There are a lot of computer users. I think now we have more ergonomic <coughs> keyboards, so it's hopefully getting better. But um, there was a study done, um, I think in the 90s, where it turns out that a lot of typists, a lot of people who work on computer really had, uh, became, started to have problems. And uh, basically, the nerves that pass through tunnels created by bones, ligaments, and other tissue can be damaged if the surrounding tissue swells and presses on them. So if I'm like that at the computer keyboard, um, the carpal tunnel here is kind of a small opening and a lot of stuff is going through here. And if the tendons, for example, swell, or the sheaths that are surrounding, um, they produce some <coughs> fluid that makes the tendons easier to glide. If there's too much fluid, for example, it will press on the nerve and you have pain and so forth. So the areas of weakness that we have as pianists are basically this part here, then the elbow and our shoulder. And those are basically the joints that our arm has. So the arm starts here, the collarbone, and we have the first joint, second, and the third. And all of those are kind of narrow openings for nerves and tendons and so forth. Out of that comes tendinitis. All of us have heard about it. Um, that's a story uh, related to that that I've told before and I'm a little bit embarrassed by it, but I think it's a good story to kind of uh, remind us to be cautious with some of our younger students. Um, when I was a high school student, um, 
I don't like classical piano too much anymore, actually kind of middle school. But, uh, you know, playing drums would, would be really cool. Uh, my parents didn't think so, so we settled on electric guitar. And I had a friend who was incredible. He took me kind of under his wings. He was a couple years older. Um, I made a lot of progress really fast because I could read music with my piano background <coughs> and so forth. Anyway, he ended up, um, you know, developing tendinitis. And it was the coolest thing ever because he was playing so fast and um, he was making such great progress and he was just playing so hard that he got this tendinitis and my, you know, 14-year-old self or whatnot was thinking, I've got to get me one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just proof that I play a lot and I'm making progress. And um, again, I'm a little bit embarrassed by that. But it was kind of, you know, no pain, no gain. I was like, if I get tendinitis, it means, um, you know, I've been working really hard. Made it. I made it. You're right. As long as you have the indents in your fingers and the blood coming out yeah. when you're playing the guitar. Oh, I had calluses sticking oh, up. There was no blood go. anymore. I was really, I was really pushing it. And again, I was progressing really fast. But um, unfortunately, sometimes we have a thought process that later on in life you go and. <laughs> I fortunately uh, never ended up following through with the tendonitis and I've become a lot smarter and I haven't had any problems. Um, but anyway, I think that's something to just keep in mind when you're working, especially with younger students and teenagers, that sometimes uh, thought processes are a little different. And I'm just saying that because I think we all feel that now we're a little bit older, we're smarter, but probably in five years we look back and <laughs> That's anyway my experience. Anyway, um, the carpal tunnel you can see here. Um, there are just a lot of things that pass through here, and any sort of strain, any sort of angle, um, could be a cause for for pain. I will, post all, I will post all of this on the website, so if you want to go back uh, later, you can do that. Cubital tunnel is the one here. Um, basically, the one in the carpal tunnel, the median nerve is the one that's most often affected, and that's the fingers toward the thumb side, and the ulnar nerve is oftentimes affected. With the tennis <coughs> elbow, I guess, is another nerve, um, name for that, and that would be the outside nerve that is affected by that. And again, you can see it's just a very small opening um, where nerves are passing through. And again, if there's inflammation or any other <coughs> discomfort, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt. I fortunately have never had that either. The shoulder is the next part. Um, there's a lot going on in the shoulders. Um, again, I'm not a professional, but I think the shoulder is the most mobile of our joints. We can move it basically in every direction. So it's a complex. Uh, group and there is of course a lot of stuff going going on too. Something that I've been fortunate that I've escaped so far and uh, maybe one thing that's good about doing those presentations is that I'm more aware of some of those things because uh, if you observe me during the day I probably don't have the best posture. So back problems hopefully are not in my future, but um, I'll keep trying. I think at the piano I have a, not a too bad of a posture because I've fortunately had teachers along the way and I've had experiences and friends who didn't have such great experiences that posture at the piano has always been kind of important to me. So I think I'm okay and I usually don't have back pain after I play piano. But here you can see that uh, survey of, again, orchestra musicians, 22% um, of musicians have lower back injuries and 11% middle back injuries. That's also a high number. Have you seen any of these forward sloping seats? Yes, and that's actually one thing that is recommended in one of those books that says you basically can't um, sit with a natural spinal curve if your legs are at a 90 degree angle, and the forward sloping seats kind of change that. Uh -huh. So for orchestral musicians, I think that's a very useful thing. For pianists, I haven't seen any in particular, like any benches. Okay. But 
that sometimes it is useful to not use a bench but an actual chair <coughs> variations. Just have a little question. I have cute little students who hate posture, right? They just want to do this. And I'm like, no, you have to sit up. And they do all sorts of weird things. But their biggest concern or their biggest complaint is that it hurts to sit up straight. So is that, I'm like, you need to build muscle. We're going to be doing that. <laughs> is that correct or am I teaching that wrong? <laughs> no, I I'm like, oh dear. There's a couple things that are coming up. Oh, okay. Like Sorry. Said, Jumping I'm the gun. A little Sorry. bit fast, but it's going to be posted <laughs> on the website. But the question is, what do we do about all of that? <clears throat> And that's where I find body mapping really interesting. And I think my students would concur that I've been mentioning that sort of thing a little bit more often lately. Again, in preparing for this presentation, I kind of shifted from the Seymour Fink book towards body mapping. So I just find it an incredible resource. I also have a very good friend who's just working on becoming Andover certified. Um, that kind of sparked my interest. Um, here are a couple definitions. But the one that I like, um, <coughs> body mapping is an activity. So it's an ongoing process. That's, I think, the most important aspect that I'm getting out of that and what I like the most. So it's not memorizing different parts and all of that stuff, but it's an activity. And one thing that I think illustrates that really neatly what's kind of going on is that, um, and that's my audience participation bit. So, could all of you imitate what I'm doing? Yeah, whether it's mirror image or okay. doesn't matter. Thank you, that's it. That was quite amazing because if we think, I didn't use any of my senses. Like, you couldn't see where your hand is. I mean, you know, smelling doesn't help you a lot, right? You couldn't feel it because it's above your head. Right? We didn't use any of our five senses. It was kind of the sixth sense. I think that's kind of fascinating. You really, if, if you think about it, we, we couldn't do that. But we can do it because we have an internal image of how our bodies look like and where things are located. Um, right, if I want to touch my knee, I can do that. I kind of know how far it is and where I need to reach. But before I get to my knee, now I don't see it. I don't feel it yet. But I kind of have a sense. Or when we walk up the stairs when it's dark, right, we can kind of naturally do that. But we don't see the stairs. Getting a little iffy when one of the steps is a little <laughs> But that is basically what body mapping is. We want to create an accurate internal image of our bodies so that we can use the body correctly. Food for thought, again, that's, that's the topic today. Uh, those are a few remarks that Thomas Mark has at the beginning of the book, and I thought they are, you know, he may just be pushing a couple of buttons. So he says, concentration is not a solution, it is part of the problem. Like, so when you play the piano, don't concentrate, you know, concentration is a problem. But what he wants to get to is that concentration means directing attention to one thing and shutting out everything else. And the appropriate mental state for musicians is one of inclusive attention. So that means when we play piano, um, you know, for example, it happens with myself too, but I ask my students, you know, how, how did, did you feel, you know, what you were doing? Did you notice that you were doing that or doing other things? And after they play, they're like, no. I, no idea that my arm was, you know, flapping or, right, because we focused on one thing about doing the correct notes, maybe our fingers, maybe the sound, but what Thomas Mark wants us um, to get to is that of inclusive concentration, that we are aware of everything. Christian, can I just make a comment? <laughs> I've had students that that happens all the time, and I'm like, don't you get it, don't you get it? So, I. You know, phones are wonderful things. Yeah. And I pull it out and I go and, you know, and I film it and they're like, oh, and this last week I was teaching one and he's playing along and I just, you know, go over and reach for my phone. He goes, oh, not the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but they catch it immediately. They'll, they'll finally catch it. When they see themselves. When they, they see it. They yep. need to see themselves. Yep. I think my students may know the iPad coming out or the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it really is strange. And for that matter, I use, I use the same for me. It's sometimes not the most pleasant thing to see us perform, but that's the most natural 
way of getting an outside image of, of our bodies. And Christian, I think it's getting that feedback from the student because when we can ask them how it feels when they're playing, I had a student who said that it was hurting all up his arms and his shoulders, and I said, well, play the piece for me. And he started playing, and I noticed the music was going all up and down the piano, but he did this. So he was doing this, sorry, you probably can't see. He was doing this instead of doing this, where he was moving, you have more movement in your shoulders, but he was doing this, and I said, where, where did you even learn that? <laughs> Who's your teacher? Well, I've never taught you that. But, but yeah, that, and he had his, his elbows locked in at his side, and that was causing so much tension because he was not letting his shoulders do the work to yep. shoulder the pain. Now here is where it's getting a little tricky, and that is sometimes we're forming habits, and then something becomes quite natural that isn't to an outside person, but it, that it is to us, for example. Um, for me, I, do, I need to work on the map of where my skull sits in relation to the spine. For me, it's totally normal that my head is, is here. Mm -hmm. That feels normal to me. And you can see that this is not, it's like, right, that's where the phone comes in, comes in handy. <coughs> so for me, I think um, I'm starting to get better and I can get to that position but the idea that actually the ears are kind of the middle of the head is kind of an, a new idea for me and that that is what sits on the spine. Also what I think a lot of us are thinking is that the eyes are at the top of the head, but they are actually in the middle going up and down. Right? So if, if I'm thinking that my head is supposed to be here, that is normal to me and totally relaxed. So for the student that plays like that, it's probably developed to be normal, yeah. right? Because you don't experience the, the rest. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, the jaw is not part of the skull is another thing that a lot of us think it is. Right? The jaw is just uh, connected by a hinge basically here, by a joint, but the head stops here and that's why our upper jaw doesn't move. So now if I kind of have a feeling or a good understanding of that, I think my head is going kind of into a different position. And if I do some exercises, like, you know, stretching and then slowly releasing, all of a sudden my head is in a different position where I'm going when I think this is normal. Right? But this is something that I need to retrain myself. And part of that is that I didn't have the right image of, internal image of what is correct. Um, there's a couple of mapping errors that Thomas Mark points out through the book. One is that the skull is supported toward the back. And that's what I think I'm thinking a little bit too. That the, the spine, you know, I can feel it in my back. That's where the weight is, so that's where it's connecting to the head. And that's actually not the case. The spine, the part of the spine that's holding the weight is actually in the center. And again, it's here, that's where, where it connects. But in my mind, I think my head is supported back here. So you can all, you know, judge your own, um, you know, body maps. And again, if I get you to, to leave here and go like, oh, then I think I've achieved my goal. We're all walking. It's not safe to say that if you had a student sitting in a chair and you said, Let's see if we can align our ears over your shoulder. What would that feel like? Is that, would that be an appropriate thing? No, I'm not. I, I over, think so. Would that be on the right track? I think that's on the right track. Okay. And something that I would be doing then is do this, but also do this. But again, it's a process. There's right. not a, a right. solution, right? Or sitting upright, you know, my parents told me that too, you know, just to sit upright. Uh, <laughs> now they were happy, but I couldn't breathe anymore. <laughs> now I'm just going to go briefly over a couple of those. Um, <coughs> and uh, as you can see, there is a video, but I don't have uh, a thing to click. So I'm just going to click on the slide and hope that the video plays.
right, I see a video, but I don't hear any sound. <laughs> no, nope. we could narrate it. <laughs> so I can, I can basically give you a little narrative, and uh, we're a little bit short, short in time. But um, what he's starting with is that um, when you're seated properly, and again, I'm not a great example whatsoever, but I'm, I'm working on that. Um, basically, the hip joint is here, and that's where the legs are bending. So the upper part from the hip joint should not change when we sit. So if I'm sitting down, I should be able to do that without changing anything at the top. Something, and he kind of, uh, he's kind of a funny, funny guy on camera. One thing that he says is like, when you sit down, it looks like nothing. <laughs> but something that I also like to do um, is uh, the mapping error at the top. <clears throat> Basically, I sit down and then I do this. <laughs> Again, on the piano, I don't do that. I'm, I'm aware of that. But um, when my students walk into my office and see me at the computer, <laughs> probably what it is. <laughs> So again, what I'm doing is I kind of rock back, and I'm not really sitting on the sitting bones anymore, and I'm almost on the tailbone, which is not a good thing to do, because that is not a weight-bearing part of the spine, that's just a part where ligaments and, and muscles can attach to. <coughs> so that is what this video is about, and I apologize for the lacking sound. Um, I'll just go to the next video. I think we can still see a few things that he's demonstrating. So he's talking about that sometimes we have the head and the neck as one unit, and we move basically as if they were one. So I'm moving like that. Now, if we are aware that there's the joint and the head is freely, I can actually lead with my head and the rest of the spine naturally follows. Is this Thomas Mark? Thomas Mark, yes. I'll just upload uh, a link to my Google Drive to our pedagogy conference and then you should be able to listen to the videos. <coughs> For one, he's kind of funny how he talks and then it will illustrate a few things that I'm talking about here. But when we're at the piano and we move, like I think all of us have seen students that move like that, right? And now it's basically one, one thing, whereas if the head is like its own, it looks a little different. So if I'm moving, now I'm actually leading my entire spine, and some of that is coming from Alexander Technique, for those of you who have experience with that, where the head is basically leading. <coughs> All right, so this is one where I think a lot of us are also kind of mismapping um, the weight bearing part of the pelvis, I was going to ask my wife actually how to pronounce it. Is it sacrum or sacrum? Sacrum. Sacrum. There are sometimes words that I just don't know yet how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's a sacrum as its keystone. So the spine is attached to the pelvis and those are kind of fused together, vertebrae. And then there's the tailbone that are individual vertebrae again, and that's, again, they are not weight bearing. Uh, the sacrum receives weight from the lumbar spine and delivers weight through the arch of the pelvis to the legs when we are standing or to the sitting bones or rockers when we are sitting. And I think that's one thing, again, to be aware of. I think, I'm thinking that the middle of my body is here, and it's not true. And I think oftentimes when we move, I think this is what I'm doing, right, if I'm bending. 
but I should actually be bending from the hip joint, which is down here. Right, so the spine goes all the way to the pelvis, and then the legs are, are separate. And that's something that I think makes a difference when we play piano too. Because now I'm just kind of moving, I'm just bending kind of in the middle, and I'm bending from the waist. And that means I keep part of the spine basically locked in, and I'm putting a lot more stress than I need to on some parts of the spine, and I'm probably also gonna lock in the head and the shoulder. <coughs> So one of the mapping errors is that the hip joints are lower than one thinks. And the hips is there, you know, the upper body is separate from the legs. Another thing that I find interesting, and I never thought about it, but when I thought, started to think about it, I think I had it wrong too. The way that I think I'm standing on my foot is the heel. Like I feel the back of my leg goes down and then there's the heel and that's where I'm standing. And that's actually not the case. As you can see here, um, it's basically the bone is in, in the middle. So it's kind of like a three-legged tripod. Mm. So that means when we pedal, naturally, the knees and the legs are going to be moving a little bit. And I think if I don't have that mapped correctly, all of that changes. That makes sense. I know you don't see, most of you don't see what I'm doing down here. But I'm glad that some of you, when I started talking about it, were like, oh. <laughs> Yes. Um, mapping the arm, it is vital to map the shoulder blades and collarbone as part of the arm. I think that's a lot of the drawbacks for us pianists that we think, you know, with our arm and we're even using our upper arms and now I'm doing that and my arm stops here but what I'm doing is I'm totally locking in my collarbone and that's where the arm actually starts so if I open that up the movement is a lot bigger and you can actually feel the collarbone moving too so even if it's just small movements at the keyboard you can feel your collarbone moving and that's something that a lot of us pianists and a lot of our students don't quite take into consideration and they kind of lock up here and they use the upper weight, uh, the upper arm and that is something that's really hard to see from the outside. And Laura, to get back to your question, I think ans asking those questions are the way to go because we don't know how students actually feel. Um, so I think we can only observe and see some patterns but then it's ourselves or the students that have to be the final judge because I think I can move pretty freely now and you wouldn't have any idea whether I'm tense or not right now something shifted a little bit now I kind of released up here but it's really hard to see or to detect <coughs> one final point and that is Mapping the point of sound, I thought that was very interesting. It's also so true. I've been a little bit uh, an amateur piano technician. You know, I studied, uh, you know, piano actions and that sort of stuff. But I never thought really about it, I think, when I played the piano. And that is the key reaches the point of sound before it reaches the key bit. And all of us, um, I think, kind of know that or are aware of that. Uh, we've heard about escapement mechanisms or double escapement mechanisms. So the jack kind of moves the hammer and then the jack slips out or depending on, on what piano you have. And then the hammer is actually on its own. It's not connected to the key for a short period of time. So the last part that we move the key actually has nothing to do with the sound. And you can do that at the piano and just see like there's the point where you have to get through when you want to sign up to play a note. So there's resistance. If I go fast enough, that's where the sound comes. If I go slow, it's going to make a little bump, but you won't hear a sound. That means that I moved the key only, or the hammer just a little bit, but it didn't reach the string. But everything that's after is free play. There's nothing that's going to happen. That doesn't mean it's not important, because that may help us to get to the next key, or to the next chord, or whatnot. But sometimes, um, 
we may find ourselves or students that play a note and just, you know. And one thing that um, my teacher was um, telling me and that a lot of us are telling our students is, you know, play to the bottom of the key. Probably write it in every jury forum, any competition. Um, and I think we mean the right thing. My teacher wanted me to, you know, have the arm free and just be able to drop it and not be afraid of, you know, hitting the right key. But the downside could be that, you know, we do that and we're holding on. And that's not the way to do it. But I think that could be a problem as well where you talked about concentrating and they're concentrating on one element. I think that's what, what we should get, get out of that. It's not like, now I learned stuff and I know it, but it's about, you know, keeping exploring. With my teacher, he would stick out the hand, but not for me to hit it, but to put it on his hand that I could feel how he drops it. In every lesson, you know, I saw the hand. <laughs> Again, a good intention, and I think I learned a lot from that, and I never got to the point where I got <coughs> stuck at the bottom of the keys or whatnot. But I think just being aware of those things and the different messages that we can send, I think is the food of thought that I want to provide. So that was really fast. I apologize for that. Again, um, I'll post the presentation, hopefully, with the video links. Um, it's worth to just hear him talk. He's, he's a nerd. <laughs> very loving, very kind of funny. But it also, he really studied that, and um, he illustrates some of those things really nicely. And you can get the book and um, the DVD through Amazon or whatnot. But again, that's just part of the healthy musicians. Like I didn't touch on hearing health whatsoever. And when my students did the presentation, it's amazing what sort of sounds we expose ourselves to and what damage some of that can do. Me playing in rock bands in high school, <laughs> probably not a good idea. Now I can't go to a rock concert anymore without earplugs. I don't know if that's age, but it's probably a better thing to do. Anyway, thank you so much. I think that concludes my part.